Uh, my Lords, the Government remains committed to introducing a system of alternative student finance, known as ASF, compatible with the principles of Islamic finance. We have received advice from the specialist consultants we appointed and will set out plans for implementation as we conclude the post-18 review at the spending review. This will ensure that students in receipt of an ASF package are not disadvantaged compared to other students in receipt of mainstream student support. Still vague, still qualified. Why can't the government make a firm commitment? They've known about this problem since 2013 and known about the solution since 2014. Every year since then, and again this September, Muslim students will have been disadvantaged. The noble Lord, Lord Young, told the House on March 13, 2017, that the Government was currently working towards a scheme being open to applications within this Parliament, then due to end in 2020. Can the Minister give the House a firm assurance that the new scheme will in fact be available for the 2021 academic year? Well, I can't give a, a firm assurance on that to the Noble Lord, but what I can say is that we continue to work through the complex range of policy, legal and system issues that will need to be resolved in order for us to develop and eventually launch an ASF uh, product. And, my Lords, we shouldn't underestimate the scale of complexity here. We are trying to replicate a system of student finance that delivers the same results as now, where students do not receive any advantage nor suffer any disadvantage through applying for ASF. My Will the Noble um, Lord the Minister assure the, the, their Lordships that this new government will do everything possible it can to open the gates as widely as possible for students from all over the world? I'm particularly keen, as you know, Your Lordship, particularly keen in Iraq students and in other students from the Middle East and from the Silk Route. I would really welcome uh, that endorsement. We need the students and they really love being here. Yes, my noble friend is, is right, because we want everyone with the ability to benefit from a higher education to be able to do so. And resolving this particular issue would therefore make a significant contribution to our widening participation agenda, ensuring that people from all faiths and backgrounds <laughs> feel that there is support to remove financial barriers to access. Was able to produce a Sharia compliant version of the Help to Buy scheme within six months from a standing start. So, why has it taken six years so far not to produce a student finance student scheme, which is obviously to the detriment of Muslim students? Well, there is a process in place, and I know that the Noble Lord, Lord Sharkey, has expressed um, uh, frustration at the, uh, at the progress of this, and indeed uh, the Noble Baroness. But going back to 2012, uh, of course, when these changes were, were, were mooted, uh, there has been a consultation that was in April 2014, and then the government uh, published it res its response to the consultation, and then, of course, we enabled the uh, process to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to, to go through Parliament through the Higher Education and Research Act 2017. And this is one of these processes that is complex and does require the time to get it right, my Lords. Well, the noble Viscount, the Minister, has just given us what can best be described as obfuscation, because this is a sorry tale dating back, as the noble Lord, Lord Sharkey said, to 2013, when Prime Minister Cameron uh, spoke to the uh, World Islamic e Economic Forum and promised a Sharia-compliant uh, uh, student loan scheme with the words, never again uh, should a Muslim in Britain feel unable to go to university because they cannot get a student loan simply because of their religion. The, the government's chosen vehicle was the Higher Education and Research Act 2017, which, of course, the noble Viscount, the minister himself, guided through your Lordship's house. And at no point did he rebut the view given to those of us involved in that uh, act when it was a bill that uh, an, an Islamic uh, compliance scheme could be in place within a year, given the political will. It's six years, three prime ministers now, since that commitment was given to the Muslim community. The noble Viscount the Minister says he's very keen, and I believe him in this, uh, in increasing diversity in our university. So how can he justify the foot dragging that is causing precisely the opposite? Well, I certainly don't call it uh, foot dragging. Can I say that we would be the first government to introduce a system of student finance compatible with Islamic finance principles? So that is a, a good start. But just to give a little bit more detail on the complexities, because we have identified and have been considering a range of issues in respect of this, and that includes accounting for the new arrangements, the degree of legal separation required, the treatment of cash flows, 
the nature of the commitments that a student will make under the new system, and the method for establishing equivalence of outcome, amongst others. My Lords, I would like to declare an interest. I co-chair the All-Party Group on Islamic Finance. Uh, the, the UK has got the largest Islamic finance market outside the world. Now, the community is telling me that we are suffering because of lack of facilities for students. So I would like to say to my noble friend, the minister, isn't it time that we put into practice the commitment given by uh, David Cameron in 2013 that Muslim students will not suffer as a result of their religion? Well, my noble friend is right, and I would just say that uh, we want to introduce this as soon as we possibly can. And I've undertaken today to give an update at the spending review, uh, which will be sometime in the autumn. But uh, can I say that uh, there are around about 40,000 uh, Muslims who, uh, who are down to study in this country. What we don't know is how many have been deterred from starting at university as a result of the uh, d delays on this particular process. Lords, the, the noble lord, the minister, has, has twice linked any further statement on this uh, sorry st tale to the uh, spending review. Could he explain to the House what the relevance of the spending review is, given that what we're talking about by his own admission is simply the extension of existing provisions which other students, uh, non-Muslim students, uh, can benefit from, and there are no uh, new uh, policy expenditure uh, implications uh, of this. And secondly, um, when might we expect the spending review? <laughs> I have been pressed on that particular matter before, and I am unable to give a particular date for that review. But can I just say that what I did uh, uh, say about the whole of the uh, tuition uh, fee process and system is that we would be um, announcing uh, the results of the uh, auger review at the spending review, and of course this is included in that. So it does make sense uh, to make the announcement when we're ready to do so and to give an update at that particular point. My Lords, might the delay be the result of it being too difficult to find a substitute for interest to match the two student loan models, um, and um, if there isn't something similar, uh, there's an argument that one side or the other is, is benefiting more? Mm. Well, it's helpful to hear that from my noble friend, because, as I say again, it is a complex issue. Uh, but can I say that we have made progress? We have legislated, as I said earlier, to make the introduction of the system possible. But we need to work through these complex issues. And there's no point in rolling the system out when it is not fit for purpose. Lord Collins of Highbury. My Lords, I beg leave to ask a question standing on my name on the order paper. My Lords, I note the time and energy that the International Coalition to End Transpl Transplant Abuse in China has dedicated to these issues. Officials have reviewed the evidence thoroughly. While the evidence is not intra, 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 <laughs> incomprehensible, <laughs> is the wrong word, <laughs> is what I'm saying, incontrovertible. <laughs> My apologies, it's a hot day. <laughs> I was just listening to all the stuff about uh, um, Muslim loans, I must admit, and student loans, and I think uh, it's not lost on everyone. We have a chance to lose a Muslim, but back to this question. <laughs> Whilst the evidence uh, we have consulted the World Health Organization and international partners. The evidence provided disturbing details about the mistreatment of Falun Gong practitioners and raised worrying questions about China's transplant system. We continue to monitor all available evidence in this regard. I thank the Noble Lord the Minister for his response and uh, welcome him back to the dispatch box. I'm glad to see he's still here. hope he is. <laughs> I hopefully will be here in September. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is uh, the tribunal's evidence was pretty strong. The WHO are saying that the Chinese transport system is ethical. Will the noble lord, the minister, actually take this up and say uh, the government should ask the WHO to examine the evidence of the tribunal and actually explain why they don't think it sustains uh, the argument that transplant harvesting is going on. 
Well, I know the Noble Lord has raised this question before and others as well from the opposition benches as well as the government benches. Noble Lord Hunt, I know, has raised this issue. I agree with the Noble Lord. The World Health Organization, I have pressed them on this very issue. Our ambassador has. The evidence that they use, of course, is based on the self-assessment made by the country who is a signatory, and in this case it is China. And it is, of course, the basis that do they meet the thresholds to what they have signed up for. There is a few countries who would actually admit, perhaps, to saying they did not. The Noble Lord makes a very valid point, and I assure the Noble Lord I continue to press on this issue directly with the World Health Organization, and we continue to press on this particular issue directly and bilaterally with the Chinese authorities as well. My Lords, may I ask the Minister if he is aware that government departments often make use of in-country in -country reports, particularly on matters relating to immigration and asylum. Now that this particular report of the tribunal is available, may I ask if you would put that particular report on the Foreign and Commonwealth Office website so people who are traveling to China for medical tourism are aware how such organs are secured, as there seems seem to be no transparency in this matter. My Lord, we have a proud tradition of respecting human rights of individuals wherever they live. Surely our bilateral trade arrangement should not impede in this particular exercise. On the first suggestion, I will certainly take that back to the FCO. On the issue of people travelling to China, and because this is an issue that's been taken up before, I know both myself and the Minister and the other place have both taken this up directly with the Home Office as well. The latest, and we've actually, as the Foreign Office, written to the Home Office um, to see and explore. Um, my understanding is um, MPs. Uh, <coughs> Maybe that's a Home Office calling in now. Um, <laughs> my, un my understanding is Canada, Spain, Israel, Italy and also Taiwan have now implemented schemes on this very issue of monitoring people travelling to China for the issue of transplants, and it's something that I wish to explore further with Home Office colleagues. My Lords, is the Noble Lord the Minister aware that the inaugural meeting last night of the all-party parliamentary group on Uyghurs, that witnesses who were there expressed great concern that many of the Uyghurs in detention centres, and there may be as many as a million of them, along with Falun Gong practitioners and people from other minorities, are being targeted through DNA tests, which they fear may be then used for forcible har harvesting of of, of, of organs. Will the Noble Lord respond to what the Noble Lord Lord Collins asked about the World Health Organization, given that 34 parliamentarians wrote in April asking for a response from the WHO, and as one has not been forthcoming, will he press the WHO to give that response, and also will he undertake to meet Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, who chaired the Independent Tribunal? Yeah. <laughs> I will, of course, be pleased to meet with uh, Sir Geoffrey Nice on the other issue, as I have already said to the Noble Lord Collins. This is something I am pressing for directly, and we will follow up with the World Health Organisation on this matter. My Lords, um, it seems from this inquiry that the time that you have to wait for an organ transplant in China is literally a matter of weeks, as opposed to every other country in the world, including similarly populous countries like India, where the wait is at least months, if not years. So could my noble friend please meet um, with the his counterpart at the Department of Health? Because it seems that maybe the Chinese have discovered some uh, miracle option in transplant matching that the rest of the world, including the NHS, needs to know about. I thank my noble friend for that useful, useful suggestion, bearing in mind I'm sitting next to the noble lady who is the Minister for Health. I'm sure she's also made note, and we can probably arrange that meeting in pre pre pretty quick time. Baroness Wheeler. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, we recognise many of the issues highlighted by ADAS. People of all ages are now living longer, sometimes with complex care needs. Social care funding for future years will be settled in the spending review, where the overall approach to funding local government will be considered in the round. Meanwhile, we have given local authorities access to up to $3.9 billion for more dedicated funding for adult social care this year, and a further $410 million is available for adult and children's services. My Lords, the ADAS survey results provide yet more evidence of the ongoing crisis in social care caused by persistent underfunding and a fragile and failing care market, as the report says. 
£700 million of plan cuts to adult social care budgets in the current financial year and a cumulative £8 billion of cuts since 2010. My Lords, on this, the last day of our current session, can the Noble Lady the Minister update the House on the timing of the Social Care Green Paper, six times delayed and now two years overdue? Given this inexcusable delay and the widespread consensus across social care of what needs to be done anyway, why can't the Government now commit to publishing a white paper with actual proposals? And hasn't the Lord's Economic Affairs Committee report calling for £15 billion extra funding to include free personal care for people needing basic washing and dressing support done the Government's job for it? Well, I share the Noble Baroness's uh, impatience on this issue, and I also agree with the um, overall conclusions of the ADAS report that older and disabled people need dignified, high-quality care and support, and that when properly resourced, it does work, and as a nation, we must make this an immediate priority, and that is why I very much welcomed the incoming Prime Minister's statement that we will fix the crisis in social care once and for all with a clear plan to give every older person the dignity and security they deserve. He will make it an, a priority of the incoming government and it will be an imminent announcement of the new health secretary as I don't know whether I will be part of that department. I'm afraid I can't commit to that um, but I'm sure that whoever is in this place um, when that comes forward uh, will be very happy to do so. Uh, my Lords, um, uh, my, my Lords uh, does my, uh, uh, noble, uh, my, first of all can I welcome the statement by the incoming Prime Minister but does my noble friend share the concern of the unfairness of the unfairness of the current system, where people who are suffering from uh, dementia are not given access to free care, or people who are suffering from motor neuron disease are not given access to free care, whereas people who are suffering from cancer do, or where people who choose to be looked after at home um, do not get free care until their assets have been run down to £23,500, but their home is not taken into account. The people who go into residential care, then their home is taken into account. And what we need now, as the noble lady uh, has indicated, is not another white paper. We need the government to write a cheque. And we move, need to move away from the system where local authorities are being asked to fund this out of business rates, which results in a postal lottery and differences in care throughout the kingdom. Well, um, I thank the Noble Lord and I thank um, him for the amount of work that he has done on this issue. It is very much welcomed. Um, he will know that the Prime Minister, um, as one of his first statements, said that his job is to protect um, you or your parents or your grandparents from the fear of having to sell your home to pay for the costs of care and this is one of the first uh, points that he made but also uh, he will also know that a long-term um, principle that the government does have is that um, there is must be a level of personal responsibility for social care in England as well as a safety net that supports <laughs> significant numbers of people today um, we do accept however that there will need to be a significant amount of funding as part of the uh, spending review commitment and that is what is being considered um, at the moment and will be imminently coming forward. My Lords, the sustainability of adult social care is, is at severe and immediate risk um, and we too welcome the Prime Minister's words yesterday. And could the Minister then confirm that he will commit to continue with the precept with the social care grant or improve better care fund after 2019 and 20? Otherwise, how can councils plan their finances for 2021? And what assurances do councils have that any future funding will be protected for adult social service budget and not be <coughs> part of the overall spending at the council's discretion? Yeah. Well, uh, the Noble Baroness is quite right that the Better Care Fund has been considered um, a great success and it is an important part of the integration uh, proposals uh, between health and social care, which the government and the NHS are committed to. Um, it is under uh, review at the moment to see how it can work uh, better and it will conclude later this year um, so that certainty can be given to local councils, which I hope uh, that she does welcome. On the issue of market instability, though, um, I would uh, like to reassure her that the number of social care beds overall has remained um, more or less constant over the last nine years and actually there are over 3,700 more home care agencies now. So while there will be inevitably some exits uh, from the market, uh, we are more reassured than we would otherwise have been. May I take the noble lady back to her res uh, reference to personal responsibility? And I think that there is a great deal of agreement across the House and elsewhere that personal responsibility is important uh, as far as social uh, care is concerned. 
But does the personal responsibility uh, uh, extend to subsidies for those who are actually on local authority placements in nursing homes? Because those who are paying for themselves privately are actively subsidising those places because local authorities can't afford adequate rates. Well, the noble baroness has uh, got to the nub of the challenge, uh, which is how we get the balance right. So this is why we have... Uh, brought forward um, the work that we have been doing, which is to make sure that while we do have the safety net in place and an element of personal responsibility, it becomes more fair. And that is why um, the um, Prime Minister and the Secretary of State have made it clear that they are determined to drive this work forward at a faster rate and with more urgency than it has been done until now. And that has been put forward as a key priority for the incoming Cabinet. My Lords, my Lords. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. My, my Lords, um, we have heard properly about the needs of the elderly. Uh, would the Minister assure us that um, people with learning disabilities um, will be, and their needs will be um, better addressed in any action the Government like, is, is likely to take, uh, as particularly um, as something like 41 per cent of the helpline calls to MENCAP uh, uh, in April were people very concerned about their loss of community care? Well, the Right Reverend Prelate has pointed out something very important, which is um, a significant uh, portion of those accessing adult social services are actually um, those uh, of working age and those with learning disabilities, and it's very important that that does not get lost uh, within the debate. And any solution which comes forward as part of the social care um, solution must address the concerns of that part of the community in a much more effective and joined-up way. And I do think that integration of social care and NHS uh, budgets and um, effective um, delivery is going to be core to that delivery. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, last week with the Salvation Army, <coughs> the charity, the International Longevity Centre UK, which I head up, um, <coughs> published a report on the funding gap in social care, in particular for older people living in rural areas. The report summarised it very well as saying there isn't just one crisis, but lots of crises, and that lo local leadership alone can't overturn the inequalities. Uh, as a co-chair of the all-party group on adult social care, I hope the noble lady, the minister, can assure me that Her Majesty's refreshed government will now prioritise this issue in the way I've suggested. Well, the noble Baroness has placed that very elegantly in terms of uh, refreshment of government, um, and I shall use that um, going forward. Um, well, I would like to... Um just uh, make the gentle point um, that the funding available for adult social care um, is increasing by 8% in real terms from 2015-16 <coughs> to 2019-20, which is a step in the right direction, but there is a recognition that to put adult social care on a sustainable footing for the future, um, there does need to be um, a settlement uh, within um, the upcoming spending review, and that is recognised. On the point that she's made about rural areas, which is important, um, a lot of this hinges on uh, workforce recruitment and retention, which can be more challenging in rural areas, and that is why the government um, has invested three million in Every Day is Different National Adult Social Care Recruitment Campaign to encourage more people to apply to work in the um, social care um, sector and to raise the profile of it. And this has had some success already, which is an encouraging picture, and we need to work harder on that. The Lord Bishop of St Albans. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the older paper. My Lords. Last week, the World Health Organization declared the Ebola outbreak in the DRC a public health emergency of international concern. This is a wake-up call to the international community that Ebola is a problem that cannot be ignored. We recognize the gravity of the situation, and that is why two days before the WHO declaration, the UK announced an additional £50 million of funding for the response in DRC. Now others must follow suit. My Lord, I uh, thank the uh, uh, noble Baroness uh, for her answer and indeed for the money that has be, been made available. Uh, one of the most effective ways of rolling out preventative health education is to use local Indigenous leadership. In 2015, Christian Aid and other charities recommended NGOs should engage with local faith leaders for this purpose. Is Her Majesty's Government following this advice? And secondly, with daily flights, between DRC and Europe and the highly infectious nature of this disease, uh, will she explain to the House the steps that are being taken for our own domestic preparedness? 
Um, I agree with the right Reverend Pellet on the importance of getting education uh, on, this, uh, on this out, and community engagement remains one of the most important factors that will help end the outbreak, and strengthening this aspect, aspect of the response is a key part of, our, of the, reset, the ongoing reset which the UK and other partners have pushed. Um, the response is increasingly working with the religious leaders to help foster community trust and ownership, and on top of our wider support, we're funding an anthropological research into community dynamics, which is working with faith leaders. On the right, Reverend Pellet's second question, uh, we do, of course, have screening at the airports uh, in the affected areas, but the Civil Contingencies Secretariat in the Cabinet Office is coordinating the UK preparedness, working closely with the Department for Health, Department for Transport and UK Border Force. Uh, we manage a returning worker scheme, so people who have travelled to the area uh, register uh, and we monitor their health. Um, we have the expertise to handle a case of Ebola in the UK with two high-level isolation units, and we undertake a risk assessment um, every two weeks and monitor to the situation daily. Uh, the, current, the, current, the current assessment is that the risk to the UK is negligible to very low. My Lord, so I... Um, I visited Sierra Leone during the last Ebola outbreak and would very much endorse what the Right Reverend Prelate said about the importance, the critical importance, and we left it too late in that outbreak, of gaining the trust of communities through religious leaders but also through young people from their own communities in order to adhere to public health measures. But during that outbreak, we didn't have the option of a vaccination. And that's why many frontline healthcare workers in West Africa died during that outbreak. Mm. We do have a vaccine this time, but I know there are concerns both about the availability of the current vaccine and stocks of that and of the potential use of a second vaccine. And I wonder if she could tell us any information on that issue. Um, the noble lady is right to highlight what uh, benefits the vaccine has brought. I think uh, previously um, the, uh, a, an outbreak of Ebola um, was um, passed on to four people, and now it's just one um, following the vaccine. And we should be very proud that UK Aid played a part, played a part in developing that vaccine. Uh, we are, of course, working very closely with the vaccine manufacturer um, and um, our, the chief medical officer in the Department of Health to ensure that we have enough vaccine. Um, and we're, of course, monitoring the numbers of vaccines which would be needed. Um, and we're we're also investing uh, and into further research to make sure that we're prepared for, for another outbreak. My Lords, can I pay tribute to Rory Stewart, who did go to Geneva and actually make the plea, make the pledge, and encourage other governments uh, to work? And of course, this disease knows no national boundaries. It's important that we address this issue globally. And of course, one of the things, as the noble lady has mentioned, in terms of building community action and public health awareness, is using every method of communication, and in, particularly in Sierra Leone, we use local radio, uh, other projects, schools. Changing behaviour was critical. Can she reassure us in this very difficult situation of a war zone that we're able to build that community action? Um, I'll join the Noble Lord in, in paying tribute to uh, my right honourable friend Rory Stewart. He achieved a lot in his short time at Difford, uh, passionately advocating for what 0.7% can do, uh, putting climate and the environment at the heart of what we do, and of course coordinating our response in Ebola and really pushing, uh, pushing the agenda on that. And I, I'm sure our new Secretary of State will be continuing that good work. Um, and the Noble Lord is also uh, right to point out the importance of communication on this, and we're working on every angle of that, making sure that we do so in the correct languages, uh, using media where we can. Um, and I mentioned before this anthropological research which we're doing, which is really looking into how we can best spread the message rather than disease. My Lords. My Lords. Reducing the spread of infection. Sorry. My Lords, as well as... Um, shall I go? The outbreak in the DRC has already affected two neighbouring countries, Uganda and Rwanda, and given that Rwanda takes up the, common, uh, the chair of the Commonwealth meeting next year, Chogham, in Kigali, June 2020, um, there is an opportunity to focus a spotlight on neglected tropical diseases. So, Ksarasi noblated the Minister, and in doing so, uh, welcome the fact that she's still in her place at the dispatch box. Um, what will this government do to ensure that the proposed summit on NTDs and malaria gives Ebola high prominence and successfully generates the resources and political will to deliver on Commonwealth and SDG commitments? 
Um, we are the leading donor of the regional preparedness, and we will be certainly be working with Rwanda to ensure that this is firmly on the agenda. My Lords, uh, as has already been um, said, it is important to uh, control the spread of uh, Ebola. Can my noble friend uh, say, are local schools closed in eastern uh, DRC? Would that help to reduce um, the spread of this infection? Uh, I thank my noble friend for that question. Of course, we're doing all we can, as I said, to reduce infection. Um, unlike in Sierra Leone, schools in the affected area currently remain open so far. They haven't been identified as a, a major source of transmission. Uh, in West Africa, we saw that school closure could actually have many negative, long-lasting effects on children and the surrounding communities. Um, and as the noble lord pointed out, um, schools are actually a way which we can um, educate people on this. Our support to UNICEF helps fund infection prevention and control work in schools near confirmed cases. And whilst ultimately the decision to shut schools uh, rests with the government of DRC, this is something that the UK monitors very closely. Lord Alton.